Thanks very much for um, coming tonight. We wanted to do, we've, in the past we've done this uh, format in the fall for all senior school parents, but we decided this year that um, we really wanted to target the, particularly the grade 12 students and parents uh, this fall to try and give you all the information, hopefully, that you will need to kind of get up and running with the whole process of applying to, selecting, thinking about, and then eventually accepting and going to university uh, next year or college or whatever you're going to carry on with next. My name is Alison McCallum and I'm the director of the University Counseling Program. I have uh, four fabulous colleagues here, uh, Greg Marchand, Ray Casey, Jake Humphreys, uh, sorry, three of them in my office. Virginia is the director of the counseling, personal counseling program. And Nikki Kaufman is here to talk about the athletic counseling as well. There's the agenda. That's what we're going to run through tonight. I'm hoping that it takes about 45 minutes to get through all of the information that we have. Many of you will have picked up um, some of the sheets. I see there's multicolored sheets out there. A lot of the, I know that there were not as many copies as there are people who wanted them. All the information, um, all the, the sheets will be available in PDF format as well as the PowerPoint slides. And we are recording this uh, evening as well. So if you want to review it at any point, you will be able to do that. Everything will be put up on the website when it's available and ready to go. Virginia is going to um, start us off tonight by talking about some of the uh, important aspects about that transition to the university piece. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Welcome. I, uh, I have uh, great pleasure in having two roles out of many roles in life and responsibilities. And one of them is, of course, my professional role as uh, head of counseling and health and wellness. And the other is my role as a parent of two graduates from SMU. And I want to just talk about the first one for a minute because part of our responsibility is absolutely looking at the well-being of the whole child. And we know that school is about, and life, is about a lot more than just learning in the classroom. And so I want to talk a little bit about that tonight just for a couple of minutes in the context of transitions. And as we know, this transition time period is one of the biggest in a person's life. The transition from secondary school to university or gap year or whatever is, is significant. So what, um, what I'd like to do is talk about um, the well-being, the health and well-being of the whole child. We know that every child is different and we also know that we are all different as parents. And my road getting my two children through one is already graduated from university, she's 29, and the other one is uh, just going through university right now. The road is not always smooth. It's not always smooth for us, and it's not always, certainly not always smooth for our kids. But I have a few uh, quotes up here that I just want to draw attention to. And one of them is that we, we all have been around long enough to know about the uncertainty of life and the world, and how that, that there are places in our world that are very competitive. And what we need to do on the top of our agenda is to help our kids become resilient, able to rebound, bounce back when, there have been, when there's been adversity, and to develop any other skills necessary to have a fulfilling life. And the skills aren't just about learning and, and in the classroom, but they're also social skill development, the emotional, their emotional well-being, and um, spiritual well-being and, of course, physical well-being. So that's what we're kind of thinking about in the context of this big transitionary and very exciting trans transitionary time. We also know our good intentions as a parent and our care for our kids can get in the way. And I'm sure my girls will tell you very quickly that I have gotten in their way at times. And so I do speak from personal experience. So what we can do, what the, the, and you guys, there may be differences of opinion, but it's the sort of essential needs of students and individuals, younger individuals, is, uh, I'll just quickly go through the list, is needing independence, need diverse learning opportunities, not just in the classroom, need to know they can pick themselves up when they've had a challenging experience. They will make mistakes, we will make mistakes. And what's important is that we also learn from those mistakes and we have enough support in place to pick ourselves up when we, when we run through, uh, get through going through bumpy times. And that we take care of life balance. And that includes all those different parts of ourselves that we, I mentioned earlier. All transitions, as we know, can be complicated. They're, they are exciting, but they can be um, interesting times. And so the stronger we all can support 
the kids and support each other is, is going to help a lot. Um, so I put some things on there and one of the ones I've added is time for away from the computer and that's just another piece about the importance of the brain and giving our, our brains a chance to have a rest and have a break. So I'm just going to highlight for a minute about the parents part piece in this and this is from my own, my own part as well is the ability to manage our own feelings. One of the things that we run across quite often is that some of our kids will get quite anxious and often when we meet the parents we find that they're really anxious too and it's understandable it is a big change it's a big time some people will be empty nesting for the first time but it's still a time when if we can just understand that those feelings are very real and important but just to be able to to manage them so that our kids don't have to carry them also when we're the pressure that sometimes is put, put on students can be very challenging for them to cope with Reframe when you're worried, if you're thinking the worst or you're, you're worried that, that things aren't going to flow as smoothly as possible, reframe your thinking about that. Learn about giving our kids space to grow. Letting go is a, is a tough one and I, again, speak from experience. It's not as easy to do as it is written on here on, on paper. Trust, get your own support if needed, and, and, and really important is monitoring the amount of pressure that we put on our kids and being able to... Um, support them when the, the challenging times are there. Is that a timer for me? <laughs> anyway, I may be up my time anyway. But, um, and also, I guess I just want to add that if you are struggling with any of these pieces, that's what all of us are here for. And please reach out and, uh, and come and see us if you need any, any support yourselves to, to walk this walk with these amazing kids. OK, thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Nikki's going to uh, give a little bit of context to the new position that we have here at School of Athletic Counseling. And if you see us ducking behind the black curtain, it's simply so that we can change the microphones. We're not doing costume changes back there. <laughs> oh, I don't know. We can do a song and dance on the way out. <laughs> Sorry, Nikki. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. As Allison mentioned, my name is Nikki Kaufman, and I am both a teacher and a coach at the school. And I'm here tonight to tell you about an exciting new initiative that we are offering as an extension of our university counseling. It is a program called Athletic Counseling. And the goal of the, for this program is to uh, help our student athletes in a way that facilitates the transition of athletics at the high school level to pursuing athletics, varsity athletics at the university level. We are finding a growing number of our student athletes interested in pursuing varsity athletics at the university level. So we felt uh, that we needed to formalize uh, this, this facilitation process with the role of an athletic counselor. So my role specifically as the athletic counselor is to help facilitate exploring uh, university uh, athletic opportunities of interest of our student athletes, to help make contact with university coaches on behalf of our, our athletes, and also to help our athletes create uh, an extensive athletic resume to pass on to universities of, of interest. Uh, that resume includes things like statistics, on, on their athletics, um, achievements in athletics, also highlight videos of them uh, in practice and also in games, and also hopefully assisting in earning university athletic scholarships. So for right now, uh, I wanna dedicate uh, my time with grade 12 student athletes at our school who might be interested in this program, uh, as it is time sensitive with them going off hopefully next year to, to university. And so that's why I wanted to um, introduce you to this program and also allow you the opportunity to have my contact information if you have any further questions about the program or would like further information. Uh, this program is open to our varsity athletes at the school in all grades at the senior level. Uh, however, priority is given to those athletes who are closer to graduation from grade 12 uh, down through to grade nines. And I do have uh, an information sheet that wasn't out in the foyer when you came in, so I will pass them on to Allison uh, if you would like uh, more information. And my contact info is on there as well. 
as I said, feel free to contact me at any time and I'm happy to discuss this, this program and hopefully help our, our student athletes to make that transition from high school athletics to university varsity athletics. Yeah, thanks. And I will now pass it on to Greg Marchand. Hi, welcome everyone. It's very nice to see everybody here. We're really pleased that so many have turned out tonight. And it's uh, a great benefit to us to be able to pass all this information on to you at one time. So thank you again for being here. I'm going to talk very briefly now about something that had nothing to do with anything when I was at university and probably the same for most of the parents in this, in this room as well, and that's social media. So Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn had, were n n only ideas in people, the back of people's minds way back then. But now they're a huge, huge reality to your students and our students. And it's something that we really need to be aware of and students really need to be aware of. We hear every year in our university counseling office about, about admissions officers at universities around the world who actually use social media to find out information about students. We also hear stories about, about employees, employers who find information about employees when they're not working for them. And, and a lot of students don't really understand entirely how powerful and how important it is to be aware of what your online presence is. So we actually have somebody in the school who is a tech technology advisor to the students. Maureen Hahn couldn't be here tonight, but one of her jobs is, is to educate your sons and daughters about technology, including their online profiles. So Maureen will be coming into all of our grade 12 graduation transition classes and talking to each of the students in grade 12 and then in grade 11 as well later about their online presence. And she will be telling them not that they have to cull things entirely, but they, they need to be careful and they need to create a presence that's professional. Online, the online presence for students is going to exist always. So it's something that's, that's there, it's something that's real, it's something that doesn't go away. So what it is important is for students to create a professional online presence so that if somebody goes to look up somebody, they get information that's going to validate what an incredible person he or she is. So we're really lucky, just like we have Nikki to help us with athletic counseling, we have technological counseling within our department as well. Great. So now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of applying specifically to universities. I think we're going to start with Canada. Jake. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know quite a few of you, and I know most of the students. So it's nice to, to be addressing familiar faces. We're very fortunate in Canada to have a wonderful university and college system. I've had the pleasure of visiting dozens of them, and I'm always impressed every time I leave with the commitment of the educators on those campuses to the success of young people. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, we are fortunate, uh, those of us who are going to apply to Canadian universities, that uh, our application system is relatively simple compared to other application systems. In many universities and colleges, actually there's nothing much more than filling in your personal information, a program choice, and academic history, and paying the application fee, which is usually quite reasonable. Uh, there are some universities that require a bit more than that, and so uh, all of our students are aware now that UBC, for example, requires a fairly comprehensive personal profile that uh, I think involves them in writing just short of about a thousand words over five question answers. So this is more than, than has been required in the past. Queen's University for several years has required what they call a personal statement of experience, which once again is a fairly comprehensive essay the student writes about his or her background and aspirations. You'll also find that for some programs, uh, supplementary applications are required, supplementary materials really, uh, but it can be a, a considered to be an application actually in, in many cases. The business schools, for example, it's one thing to 
uh, be admitted to the University of Western Ontario, it's quite another thing to be admitted to the Ivy School of Business there. And sometimes those business school supplements are, are quite involved. Uh, engineering schools often want a little bit extra as well. So students need to be prepared for that and they need to do the research to find out about those things uh, well ahead of time. I assume that most of the students sitting here tonight are in grade 12 and most of them did their research last year. Is that right? Yeah, smile. <laughs> Somebody's <still here. laughs> The academic credentials that universities require are fairly common across Canada. Uh, as you go further east and actually when you get to Nova Scotia, sometimes they want a little bit more than they want for the rest of Canada. But the transcripts we send out carry their marks from ninth grade right up to 12th grade. And those go out when we send them uh, in February. Oftentimes, for many universities now, students can actually enter their marks online. And that happens at different times during the year. Uh, sometimes uh, we have the, the benefit of uh, sort of a quasi-early admission system. It's kind of on the next slide. Um, which uh, U of Ic is quite famous for now. And they will allow students to use grade 11 marks and the list of what they're taking in grade 12 to qualify for an early offer of admission. Of course, students still have to complete their whole grade 12 year and make sure that's all good too. But the whole concept behind that is just to sort of, well for U of Ic it's a marketing thing, but for students it's great because it, it's sort of a stress reliever to have an, have an offer early on. So for the most part, uh, the universities are, are going to look for the English 12 mark, that's the king mark all across the world, they have to have that first, and three other academic subjects. They'll just take those and average them, and that will determine admission to the university itself. As I said, if you go a little further east, sometimes they want English 12 plus 4 for a total of 5. So that's getting into the university. Then there also is the question of, do you have the right courses to get into the actual program? So being admitted to an engineering program is different from being admitted to general <coughs> arts. And we go through all those kinds of qualification requirements with our students actually starting at the grade 10 level. So they're, they're well versed in what they need to choose and uh, we're making fine tuning adjustments right now at the timetables based on, for many of the students sitting here, based on what, not just what university they want to attend, but what program they want to investigate. You already mentioned the supplementaries and the grade 11 marks. So I'd like to uh, go through a few recent developments in Canada which are quite exciting. Um, Canada uh, holds, as I mentioned, holds a, a, uh, a very strong position in the world university community. And our Association of University Presidents has just taken a, another step uh, in creating what they're calling the U15. This is Canada's sort of version of the UK Russell Group universities. There are two dozen of those, or the Australian Group of Eight. Fifteen Canadian universities have declared themselves to be primarily interested and centered on research. And that's sort of an official policy statement. Now they want very much to have a say in the direction of uh, Canada's whole post-secondary uh, evolution. So. Uh, th there's, this is the first time that I know that a strong stand like this has been taken to, to say we are really keen on uh, being top research universities in the world and we want our country and our government to put some, some oomph behind that and make sure it happens. Of course, this does cause a little bit of crepitus with some of the smaller schools that you might want to term liberal arts schools because they want their say as well and they want to be valued as well. So this is an emerging issue in Canada. The first step has been taken, the statement has been made, and we'll see what the effect of it is. I think it's going to be positive. Another thing that we're noticing in Canada, uh, which has existed in other parts of the world for some time, is college-university partnerships. Uh, we now have uh, really good examples of several universities and colleges that have created dual qualification programs. So, for example, if a student attends the University of Toronto Mississauga campus, uh, he or she can earn 
a dual qualification at U of T and Sheridan College in various curricular uh, areas. Same thing at the Scarborough campus. One example there would be a U of T Bachelor of Science degree combined with a Centennial College qualification as a paramedic. So you get both of these qualifications in four years. And the wheels should be turning for students who are interested in medicine because that makes a very fine platform of application when you want to go to medical school. There are many more examples of this happening in Canada. Carleton and Algonquin College, York and Seneca, these are all Ontario examples. But you'll, you'll see that this will spread across the country as we begin to realize that one of the ways of addressing the concerns and uh, worries about future jobs and careers is to combine uh, practical qualification with an academic one. I have a bit more to say about that later. Another exciting thing that's happening uh, locally is that Boeing has announced, Boeing Aircraft has announced an internship partnership that they'll be offering through UVic, Royal Roads, and Vancouver Island University in Nanaimo. So we have yet to see what that's like, what that will be like, but this, is a, this will be a, an exciting thing for the local universities to have a partnership with Boeing. We also have uh, Canadian universities and colleges presenting new types of qualifications. Uh, a good many of them having to do with IT and the science areas. One example would be the Kwantlen College uh, Physics for Modern Technology degree. Um, seems to make pretty good sense that uh, doing a specialty like that would attract students and would produce good job, opp job opportunities later on. So let's just uh, take a look for a minute at um, the, the group of colleges that we have in Canada, which is wide ranging and serves uh, our <coughs> students extremely well. The college populations are exploding in some places, including stuff the hill here at Mosin College, where uh, every year there are new programs and there is a need for more space because more and more students want to do that. Colleges often have unique programs, uh, smaller classes, lower costs, hands-on learning environments, lower admission averages, and work experience in some of their programs. All of these things are of very, very great value to youngsters trying to move out of high school into uh, their academic training, especially when they're concerned about being employable. So a good many of these uh, programs, whether it's a certificate or a diploma or a transfer program, are orientated towards giving students skills they would need in order to move through the academic world a little more quickly, a little more easily, and come out on the other end uh, um, uh, strongly employable. Um, I think that a lot of the colleges are going to go the partnership route with universities, but even when they don't, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic way to start your post-secondary education, to, to be in a college for a year or two years, and then transfer into university. Mrs. Casey quotes an example that's uh, well known to our office, uh, which it just simply goes like this. If you go to the engineering faculty at, at UBC and uh, look at the third, third year classes, when students come in from the Camosun College Engineering Transfer Program to UBC, the UBC third year students want to grab a hold of them uh, as lab partners because their practical laboratory experience in the college program has been so strong. So we have students going to Camosun to do their engineering bridge program, then they finish off their engineering degree at another school like UBC for example. Their experiences are highly valued because they get so much more practical experience than the first and second year engineering students in, in, a, uh, in a university setting. So that's just one thing that we hear, students tell us that, so that's how we know that's true. And there are many, many other types of examples. And by the way, Mrs. Casey has, has put together a really strong document relating to college programs, which will be included with all the documents that go online for you to access later. So a college can offer you a certificate, usually it's one year in a specified skill area, or a diploma, more engaged in two years, associate degrees, which then will allow you to go to a full degree. Some colleges offer full bachelor's degrees, and some of them are involved in the dual qualification model. So what I just want you to, to think about here is making sure that you've, you've thought carefully through the college option. 
for Canada and perhaps for other places as well, but specifically and particularly for Canada. We have a wonderful group of colleges. Some of them are called university colleges. Some of them are degree-granting institutions now. And they offer a tremendous option for students who want practical experience as they build their academic careers. So that's just a, a really short encapsulation of, of what's, a, what's available in Canada, what the application system li is like, and some of the new things that are happening. Um, in the interest of getting on with it, because we have a lot to do yet, I'm going to uh, hand over, and uh, Greg, I think you're going to talk about U.S. Tell us going to talk about U.S. politics. Thank you. Two slides, yeah. So the, the U.S. colleges are not to be confused with the Canadian colleges. The U.S. colleges are equivalent, to, like the name college is equivalent to a, a university in Canada. They're degree-granting institutions. In the States, there's, there's over 3,500 of them to choose from. In Canada, we have about 100 colleges and universities total in all of Canada. So in the States, the, the number of choices you can, you can make it's, is huge. It's insurmountable. Um, as a result, I'm not going to give you a whole lot of detail because there are as many you know, variations on the theme as there are um, out there in the world. So, but in general, the U.S. colleges, we, at SMU, students, there are always a large cohort of students that are very interested in the U.S. system. We usually have maybe um, a third of the class who applies to the U.S., a quarter of the class that might go to the U.S. at the end of the day. And everyone has their own reasons for doing that. But it's really important with the U.S. system because there's so many choices. Um, it's so important that that research starts really early, that students are, are thinking about what the, where they might like to go, that they are narrowing it down to, to determine what's going to be a place that's going to be a good fit for me. Within that 3,500 colleges, there are, there's, just, there's, some, there's something for everybody for sure. And so it's really important that you do the research. And we've at, encouraged students to do that starting in grade 10 and 11 um, in, the, in the grad transition program where we work with the students individually and we also set them off on research to try and find out, okay, where might I like to go in, that, in the great United States of America? It's a, big, it's a big place. One of the other ways that's really valuable, and the same would be true in Canada um, or anywhere, is to, is to do some kind of campus tours. So if that's something that, that is possible for students to do, whether they're applying to Canadian or American or, or wherever, um, it's a great way to, to get a really good feel for the campus. This summer, I spent um, eight days in New York and Pennsylvania and visited 11 college campuses. So there were three campuses in one day, which was a bit mind-boggling. But it, in each of them, it's, it's still, they're still very distinct experiences. So you can really get a, a really good sense of what that place would be like for you if you went by putting your feet on the campus. Um, and that's, so I can't value that highly enough. It's, it's really important if you can do it. And it will help you make, hopefully, much stronger decisions as you're going. Here at school, what we do um, is we, if you were here at the very beginning, you may have seen the slides at the beginning that talked about the university presentations. So all throughout the fall, we'll end up having um, somewhere close to 80 or 90 universities come to our campus. They come, sometimes they come in, in a large group, like the Canadian University event, the Q event in, in October. So they'll come as a large group, they'll set up a big fair in the gym. Other times we have just one or two people come at a lunch hour. All, those all the announcements about that are in the electronic announcements that go out daily, and they're also um, posted on the website. So if there's universities that you're interested in, it's definitely worthwhile to, um, to go to those presentations, talk to the presenter, and especially for the U.S. system. The, the U.S. colleges, um, they like to come to our campus. They like to see the, the, the high schools that students are applying from. They very much rely on a holistic process when they're, when they're evaluating students for admission. So for them to come here and see the context in which th you, the student, has, has developed, that gives them a whole lot of information that they can use when they go back. They also are really keen to meet you. So if you're here, uh, if they're here and you, want, and you are interested in that college, it's, the best thing you could do as a student is to go to introduce yourself, to fill out their form, to fill out the card that, that says who you are and what you're interested in. And then you can start this relationship with them. As you can imagine, they have some schools have thousands of applications, you know, 30,000 applications for 3,000 spots. So there's, there's a whole lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of nuances to the process. Many of the U.S. colleges, that, that, especially the ones that students from SMU will apply to, will use something called the Common App. So that's, um, if the students have been here, were here in the spring, they will have seen uh, the, the questions, the uh, essay prompts from the, from the Common App because they changed this year. So we wanted to make sure that students knew about them. 
But the Common App is an online central system. It's about, I think it's 18 pages long, the application. The Canadian applications are maybe three, two pages long, mostly biographical data. And the Common App, they want to know everything. They want a personal essay. They want supplementary applications. They want to know, you know what you ate for breakfast and what your favorite memory was from when you were two. Um, but they're, they're very detailed, they're very in-depth, and they take a lot of time. So it's definitely important that as a student it, or, and as a family, really, if you're, if you're interested in the U.S. system, that you know just how much time you have to devote to that process. In order to be successful, it's, it's going to take time for sure. The one other system that we do have lots of students applying to in the U.S. is the California system. So in, in, within, within California, there are private colleges, there's state colleges, and then there's the University of California system. They have their own common application, and uh, that application is, is, has the same content, essentially, as the common app that you see that, that I've referenced up here. But with that app, it's, one of the nice things about it is you can, with one application, actually apply to eight universities without eight supplements. So that, that's, uh, if you're looking at the, the University of California system, it's definitely something to consider. So when you apply, um, students will be asked for a few things. Money, of course, is one part of it. It's usually about $75 per application for a college that you're applying to. And you, that's all. those are all paid by credit card. One of the other things that they're going to ask for, many colleges are, uh, still require standardized test scores. There are some test optional schools out there. Um, and there's certainly some that our students apply to and are, are, will consider or even go to. But a lot of the, the colleges will, apply, will require that you have those standardized tests. So that's either the SAT or the ACT. Um, we have the Education Extension runs some prep courses for that, and they have lots of resources um, to try and help you get ready for, the, for those tests if you need some resources from school. If you're an international student, then you're going to want to make sure that you, that you know about whether you have a need for writing the TOEFL test, the English test of English as a foreign language, or IELTS, which is just a different, uh, another English language testing program. But those are all required. Any of those tests, are have to, you have to submit the, those tests, you have to, or you have to take those tests before the application deadline. For the U.S., the application deadline is depending on where you're applying. If you're applying in California, it's November, by the end of November. If you're applying to those common app schools, very often it's, it's January 1. But here, because we're not in school during the month of, you know, half of the month of December, we ask students to get all their applications ready and done kind of by December, early December, so that we can do from the school side of things, we can do all the things we need to do in terms of sending off your transcript your, with your term reports, and your school report, your reference letters, all these details that come along with it. They do, as I say, have this holistic approach. So in Canada, it's quite straightforward for a lot of the college, for a lot of our universities. They say, we want to see your English mark, your three or four best academic subjects, and sometimes a supplementary thing, like for business or for engineering. In the US, they, they, want, they want everything from grade nine to 12. They want your essay. They want reference letters from teachers. They want a reference letter from, from the university counselor, whoever the person is at school. And uh, sometimes ref resumes. Sometimes they want a letter from a peer. We've had, there's a couple of colleges that require you have to get a friend to write a letter on your behalf. Um, so they're, they're really looking at this broad, very broad picture of who you are and trying to make sure that you are a good fit for them. And that is the same approach you need to take when you're looking at the colleges. You want to look and say, is this, is this place going to be a good fit for me? And that's, that's the biggest thing to do with, with the, where you're going to have to spend a lot of your time with the U.S. system is just figuring out, okay, what are the places that are actually right for me? And making sure that you've, you've got that list narrowed down. We talk in the office, especially with the U.S. system, because it's not as predictable as the Canadian system about as to where people might get in. Um, with the U.S., we often talk about uh, building a list of colleges, and some of you will have picked up a worksheet that, that to try and help um, organize your thoughts as you go through building a list of colleges. We talk about dream schools, so places that you think, wow, that would be so fantastic to go. Uh, you know, the, the, the likely school, you think, okay, it's likely that I could get in there. And then there's sort of the reality, yeah, for sure, I'm going to get in there. Because we want to know that you have some safety schools if you're looking at the U.S. We would use the same kind of mindset with Canada, but it's a little easier to tell. Because with the Canadian universities, they give us information that says, you know, we, we know that last year it, you had to get... Uh, I think it was 83% to in order to be admissible to 
fa faculty of fine arts at or faculty of arts at UVic. So we know pretty precisely, you know, how what you need to get in order to be able to to be admissible there. The states is is very different that way. They, we don't have as much because they use that holistic process. They're looking at all kinds of things for it. So it's just really important that, that the research part of it in the U.S. is certainly is is huge is key. I should have said at the beginning that if you have questions as we go, you can certainly ask them. Um, we will stick around afterwards for a few minutes um, if, you, if you want to catch up with any of us. And of course, you'll have our contact information at the end. Greg's going to talk about um, some other international opportunities. I'll, I'll try to be quick. I know that this is a lot of information that we're passing on to you. But we're very lucky in this school to be able to, as Allison pointed out, travel to universities literally around the world. So we have all, all of us, been to universities in the UK. I've been to universities in Hong Kong. Um, we've been to universities in Australia. Mr. Humphreys has traveled there. Um, we, all across the United States. Uh, and the, being able to actually walk on these campuses, show pictures to students uh, that, of the places that we have been is incredibly invaluable. In the UK, you might ask yourself, why would students apply to go there? Well, there are a number of reasons. Many of our students look to uh, try to, trying to be able to go through a medical program a little bit more quickly in the, in the United Kingdom. And, and so we get a lot of students interested in applying to the UK for that reason. We get a lot of students interested in applying to the UK just to have a more international experience. Some have relatives in the United Kingdom. Um, there are a myriad of reasons. So every year we have around a dozen to 15 students who apply to the UK. And every year we have maybe half a dozen who actually attend uh, schools in the UK. Uh, the um, application process is quite different than it is in applying to Canada and to the United States. There is an online process that all students have to use called UCAS and, and the um, students can apply to universities um, throughout the United Kingdom simply by going to this site. We help them with this process because one of the things that's really important is just like in the United States, when students who apply to the United States, they have to write a personal statement. The personal statement to the United Kingdom is very different than it is to the United States. The, the, student, the schools in the, in the United Kingdom want students to talk about how they match the subject area that they're applying to. They don't want to hear about what they had for breakfast at all. They want to hear about how they are going to be biomedical students especially if, the, if students are applying to medical schools. I put the date for medical schools up there, I think on the next one, um, because it comes very, very quickly. So that's another thing that's, that if, if a student is applying to Ox, Oxford or Cambridge, we call them Oxbridge, to any kind of a medical school, including dentistry and veterinary, they have to have their application completed by the beginning of October, October of this year. So any students who are interested in applying to the UK have had to talk to us already about that because we've had to go through beginning to think about that process. If you haven't, you need to see your counselor right away because this process is it, just so, so fast. We also have to have, ask our teachers to supply predicted marks for their students, <laughs> anticipated marks that they're going to get by the end of the year when they apply to the UK. And that asks an awful lot of, of, of teachers. But it's one of the reasons why we say to our students that you've got to start the year running, especially if you're thinking about the UK. So if you are at all interested and you haven't talked to your counselor, you need to do it soon. Mm. Yes? Do you think it would be better to apply with the Canadian citizenship or with the British citizenship? It, it's, um, you're, you're, it's a different different system, and you're and you're you're looked at differently. Um, but it is easier to get into the UK as a citizen. So yeah, if you have if you have citizenship, it actually is really valuable. The process of applying to the different parts of the UK is slightly different too, especially for medical school. If you're looking at a medical school in Ireland, and we've had students get into Irish medical schools, you have to go through what's called the um, Atlantic Bridge program that's down at the bottom there, 
which is based in California. It's, it's, California has the clearinghouse for, uh, for Atlantic Bridge, so all of your information goes down there and then it goes over to Ireland. It's, it's, it seems <laughs> odd, but, but that's how it's done. Um, the, the deadline's a little bit later for that. You don't have to have it done by October. It's closer to November. But it still is a process that, that requires an awful lot of early work by students. You don't have to apply to a medical school or to Oxford or Cambridge in, in uh, the UK. We've, got, we've had students who have, who have been, have gone to Bath, have gone to Leicester, who've gone up to Scotland, to St. Andrews, to Edinburgh, to Glasgow. So there are students all over the United Kingdom from, from here. And the, the dead, deadline is a little bit more rolling if you don't go to those top flight schools or to the medical programs. But the earlier you get it in, actually, the better. So it is something that students need to jump on really, really quickly. Any other questions about the UK? As I said, I had the pleasure of traveling in Hong Kong as well and visiting the, the three major English language speaking schools there. And I was just completely captivated by them. They're just phenomenal places and they're really good options for our students. The process of applying to them is really quite similar to applying to a Canadian university. Um, you, you can present um, SAT tests if you want, but they're not necessary. As I, I, I didn't point out that that's the same thing with the, the UK. It's not necessary to have standardized testing, but it is helpful. They do like to see that. Same thing when you're applying to, to Hong Kong. But they look really just at a BC um, graduation certificate. That's basically what you require. Mm. You mentioned um, these types of schools in the UK before. Yes. Are they, are they going on scholarship or are they going on their own yes. Most of them are paying their way. There, there isn't a lot that's available for scholarships for students going to the UK. So, so that's something we talk to students about too. Sometimes, sometimes uh, there's, there's more money available to go to, to the United States. Um, uh, Mrs. Casey is going to talk a little bit about financing it, it, when she talks, uh, when, when, when her turn comes just next. But, but, but because the schools in the United States, many of which are need blind, if, if students and their families present the, the fact that they uh, actually are in need of money, it can, be, it can be relatively inexpensive to go to those great schools. In the, in the UK, it's, it's a bit different because there's not as much money available. Although we did have a student last year who got a full ride scholarship to Cambridge. So there have been students who have <laughs> That's very rare. <laughs> Uh, we've also, I haven't traveled to Australia, but Mr. Humphreys has, and, and uh, ha has incredible stories about Australian universities. The one difference uh, applying to Australia, though, and this is something that we, we, we talk to our students a lot about, is the fact that they have, in the Antipodes, a much different time frame for university. So they don't start university until January. So students, if you were applying to go to Australia for next year, you wouldn't be doing your application until the summer of this year. And it gets really confusing because you obviously want to have an acceptance somewhere. So it, it becomes a toss up to say, well, maybe I'm going to try to get somewhere in Canada or somewhere in the United Kingdom and then hope I get into Australia and then maybe I'll go there in January. Or I'm just going to apply to Australia only and forget about any other universities. So it's a tough decision. You have to make your mind up pretty early about Australia if that's really where you want to go. But there are some phenomenal opportunities there. And you can, you can come and talk to us about them uh, as well. And there, the, the, um, Australia is phenomenal in the fact that they have this global links learning abroad process so that students can actually get all the help they need from this um, arm's length institution that the uh, New Zealand and, and Australian un universities pay for. Uh, it's, it's just really a valuable service and, and we present students how they can get information about that as well. So, Truly, the world is our students' oyster as far, does that, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> the pearl in the middle of the oyster. That's the metaphor that I wanted. <laughs> and they have opportunities to go really wherever they want. And, and uh, we really like to try to encourage that. Canada's phenomenal. And we really look for what is the right fit for students. But we have experience to be able to give them some information to go anywhere they want to go. Another question? Um, how does uh, some of the kids have to grade 12 go on what they call a gap year? How does that play into, does that really compromise uh, their options or uh, likelihood of getting into the school? 
No, no. In, in fact, uh, more and more students are taking gap years that we've found that, that last year, a dozen or more. It was, it's really phenomenal how many have, have decided to do that. One of the things that we require, though, is that a student who's taking a gap year gets an acceptance at a university and then applies to have that acceptance deferred so that they can go off knowing that they have somewhere to go when they come back. And, and I, that, that makes, it makes it so much easier for them to have that. Sometimes they don't go to that school. They apply somewhere else and go somewhere else. But to have an acceptance, de defer that acceptance, is just something in your back pocket when you go and take a gap year. That's right. You have to do it after you've been accepted, yeah. If you say, um, I want to apply, but I don't want to go, then you're probably not going to get in. <laughs> but the process, the process can be a, a little bit dicey, so, so we coach students about how they actually apply for a, a deferral, if that's what they want to do. Yes? Absolutely. They, every student has to. Oh, no. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are a university preparatory school, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. Uh, they, I mean, it, it's not like we arm twist them. It's what they want to do, and so we we just we guide them. We take them by their hands. <laughs> I think Miss Casey is going to talk about finances now, the money stuff. Yeah, you've had the good news, and now here I am. I'm the wet blanket to give you a bit of the bad news, uh, but there is good news somewhere in my presentation. The bad news centers around this, and that is that most of you will be aware that university does cost money. It costs a phenomenal amount of money, actually. And it's important for parents and uh, their youngsters to have a conversation quite quickly about what is possible financially. Um, it does no good for students to think that they're going to go off to a prestigious university in the United States if the family simply can't afford $60,000 a year uh, in which, with which to do that. So there has to be a conversation around the dinner table at home uh, regarding finance right off the top. It is expensive. We're looking at $60,000 a year to go to school in the U.S., uh, upwards of $40,000 in the U.K., and somewhere around $25,000 all in with residence, food, and tuition paid for to go to, to school in Canada. So it is an expensive proposition all round and one that everybody needs to be aware of. There are tons of different opportunities for financing this business. Uh, of course, most of the students sitting in the room tonight are hoping that, oh my goodness, I hope mom and dad have done something about this. So that's the first place they tend to look as they start fleecing your pockets uh, to find out whether you in fact have, uh, have saved up a little bit of money. Um, sometimes they will have been beneficiaries of gifts and so that will help out a little bit. We're all hoping as adults and people who are looking after children that they are going to put some money toward this. So we're encouraging them to go get out there in the summertime or when they have breaks or whatever to do a little bit of work to help to finance their education. It has been proven, we've seen it many, many times, that if students are having to pay part of the way, they tend to do a little bit better than if school is simply paid for. Um, so do encourage them to get out there and to participate in this. Uh, Student savings, uh, and then we'll talk about scholarships, bursaries, and loans, the, the bad part of all of this. Um, there is university financial aid, which Mr. Marchand alluded to a little bit, uh, a little bit ago, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Co-ops and internships, these are the last four things on here are things that can happen once you're at university. So I would encourage you, to, once you get to university or your post-secondary institution, to have a look at the opportunities for co-op educational experiences where you might be paid. For example, my son who went into engineering at UBC happily ended up in Fort McMurray for part of his co-ops and boom, his entire university education was paid for. Um, so uh, <laughs> there are opportunities out of co-ops to, uh, to make a little money and, uh, and to go on, besides the fact that co-ops, I think, are a wonderful opportunity for students. 
Um, in course scholarships, once you go off to university, there are opportunities to earn still more money. So don't worry if you don't get that full ride scholarship the first year. You could still be in the money in second and third and fourth years as you uh, become more used to how school goes at the university. So keep up the good work and quite likely you will be rewarded for it. Work study programs, particularly in the United States, but certainly here, if you go to Farquhar Auditorium at UVic, you'll notice that there are students standing around offering you tickets and showing you to your seat. Those people are on uh, work study programs. They are being offered employment at the university. And so that's another way that you can earn some money with which to go to school. And finally, do uh, all of you uh, do, uh, do your tax, income tax returns because uh, there will be money coming back to you as a result of uh, just simply being uh, a Canadian citizen. You will be getting some money back as a personal income tax uh, individual. Uh, you will get a few, uh, maybe a few hundred dollars back. So all kinds of ways that you can earn, earn some money uh, by uh, going off to school and so on. Um, the types of awards that you're going to run into. First of all, scholarships. Yay, those are the great ones that we want because that's money in your pocket, nothing to be, uh, nothing to be paid back. Uh, bursaries are the same. The only difference between scholarships and bursaries uh, is the only difference is that you uh, have to demonstrate financial need. You demonstrate financial need by, first of all, applying for um, a BC or uh, Government of Canada loan, once you've submitted that and all of the paperwork that goes along with that, the universities or whomever will decide whether you are, uh, whether you have uh, need. And once they've determined that you have need, then there will be, be bursaries offered. So it's essentially it goes by financial need. And lastly, the one that we don't want to talk about very much is loans. Um, loans are required by some people, um, by many people in fact. Most of the students at university are, are there having taken some loans and are working very hard and all of that sort of thing. So uh, loans are available to you. You do have to apply for loans through, uh, through our governments and certainly you could apply for loans personally as well. So the difficulty with loans, of course, is that they have to be paid back. It's not money in your pocket that, uh, that never can be taken away. You do have to pay that money back, and that's why we call it the baddie of the, of the, uh, loans, or of the financial situation here. Uh, possible, possibilities for scholarships, the types that are out there. We do have provincial scholarships offered by uh, the Ministry of Education. There are university entrance awards. There are major university entrance awards, and then there are tons of private scholarships. We just have to find them. I'll talk about the provincial scholarships first. There is the Passport to Education. We're given only a few of these, and uh, generally here at the school, they're given to the highest ranking uh, academic students, and sometimes those who have done a great deal of service around here. Unfortunately, uh, the cutoff for that is very, very high. Where it might be slightly lower in some schools, the cutoff is going to be quite high here because we have a lot of students here who, who perform very, very well. You uh, must be a BC or a BC and ca Canadian resident in order to be eligible for all of the provincial scholarships. Um, the provincial scholarship changed last year, so the qualifiers are a little bit different uh, for this one. You have to pass English 12 with a B. You have to have passed all five provincial, provincially examinable subjects, three of them in grade 10, uh, social studies 11, and then English 12. So all five of those must be passed. And then you have to be, your average must be in the top 5,000 in the province in order to win the money. For many of the students in, in this room and at St. Michael's, that's going to be a pretty easy thing to do. Uh, we will be populating, I think, uh, a large number of those 5,000 spots. Um, there are the Dogwood District scholarships as well. This takes place in April, and it's a scholarship that's open to a fabulous uh, group of people. These are the people who may not be the highest academics uh, in the school, but they're the ones with all the talent and the passion. There, there are artists our speedsters, uh, our athletes, our public speakers, our thespians, all of those people who have wonderful, wonderful skills. We had a, a boy from here uh, two years ago who was into model airplane building and he took his model airplane to the district scholarships, flew this helicopter and buzzed around all over the place and won himself a thousand dollars. So uh, it, this, was, this was a hobby that he was able to explain at great length. Uh, he was able to talk about how the 
how the helicopter operated, what was going on in the electronics and all of that sort of thing. It was a hobby that he did at home. He wasn't involved with that here, and yet he was the winner for that. So you can bring your hobby from outside to these district scholarships as well. So it's, it's really a fun evening. It's done at one of the independent schools here. You're competing against only students from independent schools. Uh, on the island and generally there's about 42 awards given out in that so it's a there's a, there's an awful lot of opportunity to win if you happen to have passion and a wonderful interest in in something special moving on to the universities then we have the entrance scholarships and many of you have this little pink sheet the pinky orangey corally colored sheet in your paws this is my cheat sheet to uh, Canadian University entrance scholarships um, it is not written in stone. These things change every year, um, but it gives you some idea. I heard some people sitting behind me. They're going through it and they're saying, oh, I can get a 60% average or I can get a 70% average. I'm in the money already, and that is true. Uh, many of the entrance scholarships are based uh, entirely on uh, academic merit, and they usually have a sliding scale. So if you get 70%, 70 to 75%, you're in the money for $500, 75 and above, $1,000, and when you get up to 90%, you maybe have $2,500 right off the top. So that when you hear about the, all the money that Smoothians are, are winning, quite often it's those merit-based scholarships that you're hearing about, supplemented by some of the really whiz-bang stuff that's going on in the major scholarship world. But a lot of the scholarship money is coming from uh, the merit scholarships. Quite often, these you, you don't have to apply for these. You simply send in your marks, and they start sending you uh, offers of admission uh, attached to that is an offer of scholarship. Mm -hmm. Is this only for the first year and then after that it's not there? These would be primarily for first year. These are entrance scholarships. Yeah, well, yeah, that's partly it's marketing. Partly it is marketing. I can't, can't lie. <laughs> partly it's marketing. They're saying, please, please, please come to our university and we'll offer you $2,000 to do that or $4,000 or $10,000 or what, whatever it might be. So they're trying to encourage the students to come. That's why scholarships are offered. On beyond that, like I said, you, can, you may get in-course scholarships as you move through second and third and fourth year. So do apply again uh, because there is money out there. The major scholarships are a little bit different in that they are generally based on academic merit and what you've done as a community member. So that's why all of the four of us will be talking to you about being involved in your school and, and outside community because when you apply for major scholarships you are going to be handed a five page application form on which they're going to ask all about your, uh, your marks but they're also going to ask about what you're doing around school and in your community. How are you volunteering? What sorts of activities are you involved in? Are you involved in student government or some of the programs that are going on here at the school? And you should be able to demonstrate leadership in those, in those activities. So you should have started way back in grade nine and you should have worked through uh, the service club until you were taking over the service club and then maybe initiating your own uh, activity. It's, it's those, sorts of, um, those sorts of programs that actually are uh, are winning people scholarships. It's not the only reason, for goodness sake, for being involved in your community. It should be way down the totem pole as far as I'm concerned, but nonetheless, um, uh, we would like people to be well-rounded citizens here and ex excellent academics, and those, those are the sorts of people who will win those awards. Generally, those awards are full-ride scholarships, which means that your, everything is paid for uh, for the first year, and then sometimes they knock off the um, the residents because they know that in second year people start to move on and don't go to residence anymore so they'll pay your tuition for the, f the subsequent second third and fourth years if you keep your marks to a standard that they expect which is sometimes quite difficult to do don't lose heart if you win that major scholarship but lose it you can always gain it back because there are those in-course scholarships coming up later on so don't don't forget that when you get there remember mrs casey's voice <laughs> Um, private scholar scholarships, lots of private scholarships out there. You do have to hunt for them, and I'm one of the people that will be hunting for you. I have a file drawer in my office, which, uh, which I open very frequently, and we search for uh, private scholarships. And then, of course, they cross over through the Internet, and you can certainly go out there and search for them as well. Uh, 
outfits as diverse as Coca-Cola, the TD Bank, uh, Zonta International, a women's uh, organization, all offer scholarships. And if you start adding up the $500 scholarships, pretty soon you've got your tuition paid for. So if you have time to work on this and to research and to apply, uh, then you can make yourself some money. So down to the nitty-gritty how do you apply you simply you we would like you to create a resume in Naviance um, the grade 12s will know about Naviance um, we we hound you about creating your resume we would like it updated whenever we go into a committee to decide on scholarships we take the Naviance resume with us so it is a really important document for you to complete so that we have something that gives us a general outline of all of the things that you've done uh, do c you will probably have to create a personal statement if you are going to be applying for the major scholarships uh, because that will be required of you. They will ask you without, without a doubt, they will ask you about your leadership opportunities and how you've been a leader and what you've learned from your leadership experiences. <coughs> Excuse me. You're welcome to see me. You will have had, anybody who's in grade 12 will have had at least three uh, emails from me already talking about scholarships. You know that the U of T major scholarship is going to be due fairly shortly, so anybody who's interested in the U of T needs to see me right away. The Loran, the major scholarship in all of Canada, is coming due in uh, October, November, and I've emailed you about that one, and I think I've emailed you about one other. So uh, listen to what, when my emails come out to you, please don't just junk them, please just have a quick read. <laughs> yes. I did not, no. Um, I could, I could start putting them up in the announcements if that would be of help to anyone. I, um, I think, I believe parents through the parent portal can see the announcements for each day. Mm -hmm. Um, the in, the merit-based scholarships are for international students. The Loran is not, and nor is the U of T major. And I believe that that's true for uh, several of the other uni Canadian universities as well. But most of the universities now have will open up the scholarships to um, international students, and some of them even have special scholarships for international students. So it's really important to go to the web pages and just go to, you'll find finance and scholarships, hit that button and uh, go and have a look at what's available for people. Um, the students need to request reference letters and you should do that well in advance. A teacher is not able to write a le letter of reference overnight. They need time to think about it, to, uh, to do a good job of the writing process. And so uh, please do give them at least two, two weeks and preferably more time. So as soon as you know that you're going to be applying for a scholarship, you should be talking to your teachers and requesting through Naviance uh, their references. Please do, I, I enjoy actually reading all of your applications and I enjoy helping you with them. So please do use my office uh, as a place where you can come for proofreading and for ideas. Uh, quite often students will come in and say, I don't have any idea what, I, what to write in this paragraph. We sit for a while and we talk and pretty soon an idea will come to us. So please do use me as a, as a resource for generating ideas and for proofreading. Now, quickly, U.S. financial aid. Uh, there, uh, there's approximately 150 post-secondary institutions that offer financial aid to international students, and Canadian students going to the U.S. are indeed international students. So we're in that pool with, with everybody else from the world. Few offer uh, merit-based scholarships. Uh, funding is generally need-based, so there, if, uh, if you, on the Common App, if you need financial aid in the U.S., it's best to check that box and be honest uh, that you need financial aid. They are, they're not wildly keen about uh, applicants who don't check that box and then come back to them later and say, oh, but I do need financial, financial aid. They want to know right off the top. Um, most schools now read need aware in the U.S., so in other words, they are, if there are two applicants, one who doesn't have need and one who does have need, they're likely to choose the person who doesn't have need. Um, so they are need aware when they're reading. However, there are a few of the very well endowed schools who are, enjoy the luxury of being able to read need blind, which means they're, they don't care whether you have any need, and some of them will even uh, pay 100% of financial need on top of that. 
they're the very wealthy schools you probably know which ones they are uh, and uh, so that might be if you have a truly burning desire to go to the uh, to the US and you have an amazing something amazing about you other than your marks uh, you could apply to those universities and perhaps they'll choose you and they might even pay the whole way. So, um, so that possibility is there and that's one way that you make a U.S. Uh, a US ed education affordable. Um, Canadians who apply to uh, the U.S. will have to fill in the CSS profile which is a query about your financial state of affairs and if you are a U.S. citizen you will have to fill in both the FAFSA form um, and the CSS profile most likely. U.S. financial aid packages are comprised of a, a variety of different things. Scholarships and financial aid are two different things. Financial aid being the entire package. Scholarship would be part of that package. Again, scholarships are simply money in your pocket and part of the financial aid package. So if a uh, university says well, it's going to cost you $60,000 to come to this university, you fill in your profile form and say the family can afford $30,000, then financial aid is supposed to make up that other 30%. The university may not offer all of that 30%, but should they, if they do, they would be offering it to you in the form of scholarships, grants, loans, work-study opportunities, and of course they'll be looking for parent contributions in that as well. I'm not going to talk at all. I have U.S. athletic scholarships up here and I'm not going to talk very much about that because uh, Nikki will have much more information about that. Just to say that if you're hoping to get an athletic scholarship, you should start very early. You should have started by now if you're sitting here in grade 12. Uh, you need to make yourself known to coaches because uh, um, because you have to make the contact. They, they, won't, they aren't allowed to. Uh, and I think I'm just going to go on from there because you no doubt will be talking to Nikki. Uh, if you need more information, the, the best and most up-to-date information is on the university websites. Uh, if you need loans, if you're thinking about loans at all, canlearn.ca is the government loan funding uh, information. You're welcome to make an appointment with me and sit down for half an hour and we'll go through the whole process. I love having parents and, and students in my office because then we can talk about the whole package together. Um, please do read my emails, listen for announcements, make sure you surf the net and sources of information right up there including one for international students as well. So uh, I thank you very much for your kind attention and please do see me. All right, so you've gone through how to apply, you've got how to pay for it, and now we just have the, there's a great video that came up uh, last spring when we had a presentation by um, SFU. They came over, Simon Fraser University over in Burnaby came over and uh, did a really neat presentation for us that um, Jake's going to present. Just a few remarks uh, before we start the video. We start the uh, whole concept of career investigation with the students in HCE 9 and then planning 10. In the Naviance software that you've heard us uh, refer to, which you as parents can be a part of as well, uh, your students go through the Myers-Briggs type indicator as a personality scan. They also can do a learning styles inventory that's based on the Holland Code system. And there is a University of Texas career clusters, career assessment as well. So there are online tools that they can use to start that process and an enormous amount of information comes out of those links. Another thing we do now, we're in our fifth year, is we have our career week. It's coming in February this year, where a large group of, of alumni come in to present their career paths. And we have visitors as well who are not alumni. Last year, we had a keynote speaker uh, who was a futurist. I don't know if, how many of you heard him, but he had uh, fascinating things to say about uh, opening up uh, what, what's going to be happening in the future uh, for, for uh, jobs. So, we ran across this uh, and the SFU uh, recruitment office actually presented it to us uh, at one point when they visited here. And this is just a, a really nice sort of presentation about evolving ideas with respect to the relationship between a career and a job and how to kind of formulate and, and think about that. It's actually written for university students, so it says, what am I going to do with my degree? But it's it's the perfect time for, for high school students to be looking at that so that they have that mindset of investigation of this issue. What am I going to do after I'm done? Do I have some kind of a plan 
that's going to maximize uh, my talents? And have I got things kind of lined up to make use of that? So that after I finish my degree, I'll have something I know I can, need, can do that will lead to success in the employment world. So that, we're just going to show you that, and I think that's the last item. This will also be on the uh, website so that you can go back and see that again. It's a YouTube video, so you can go back and see it another time if you wish to. Okay. Have you ever been asked what you're going to do when you graduate? Or what you're going to do with your degree? Are these questions you dread? These types of questions are asked because many people think that plans are critical to success. With regards to career plans, the goal is to identify a preferred career. This can be done by looking at what you're good at, what you like doing, what's important to you, etc. and seeing where there's a good career match. From here, you then try to envision that same career in five to 10 years time. And having done this, you could then identify the steps you need to take to reach that goal, the types of educational opportunities, experiential opportunities, etc. And once you get there, life is nothing but happiness. The problem is, this model seldom works. Why is that? Well, let's start with the occupation or career you've identified. There are a lot of things that will influence whether or not that specific career will be an option for you in the future. Things like the state of the economy, which are increasingly influenced by global factors. Similarly, political factors, environmental and societal changes. These will all influence the types of opportunities available to you. Lastly, there's this little thing called technology that has changed everything. Some of the most in-demand positions today didn't exist five to 10 years ago. Even more traditional jobs like accountants and doctors now look very different than they did just 10 to 20 years ago. So as a result of these external pressures, the career you identified is actually a moving target. We don't know where it'll end up or if it'll even be around in five to 10 years. And if it does exist, it will likely look very different. And then on the other side, there's the you part of the equation. Every time you engage with the world, you change the world a little bit, and the world changes you. Every time you take a course, every time you volunteer, do a co-op, take on a summer job, all these things will change you in some way, whether that change is small or more significant. And with each thing you do and learn, your view of the world and the things you might want to do will also likely change. So given these changes that we can expect in you and the external influences put on your original career idea, the likelihood of these two matching up in five to 10 years is, in my view, highly unlikely. So instead of worrying about what you might want to do or who you're going to be when you graduate, I think it makes much more sense to identify the things that you could be doing now, today. And with each thing you do, take the time to reflect on what you liked and didn't like about each experience. Think too about what you were good at and what brought you the most satisfaction as these will provide you with clues for the types of possibilities you may want to pursue in the future. Doing this will provide you with concrete experience and connections and will increase the likelihood of you ending up somewhere you want to be, whether or not it's that place you had originally envisioned. So, stay open, take action, and keep learning. And if you're not sure where to start, talk to someone at Career Services or Volunteer Services. That's why we're here. So I would say the same thing about, uh, you could go to SFU and talk to someone at Career Services, but I think uh, you might find that we're also very helpful. <laughs> We'd like to think that we are anyway. Um, it's been great to have so many people in the audience here today. I'm really delighted that you, that you came. We, in the four of us in the office, really do enjoy um, what we do, and we enjoy working with students as they go through this process of trying to figure out what's gonna come next and how they're gonna get there. If you have any questions as you go along, as parents or as students, of course, you know who we are and where to find us. As parents, um, please feel free to contact us at any, at any point. Um, we, our contact information is readily available if you don't already know who we are. Um, and that's it for the evening. The presentations, as I say, will be up on the web. There'll be something probably come out in the SMU review when it's available online, and you'll be able to click on the link and get to the site, which will have all the, all the links, the documents, and the, and the video footage from this evening's presentation. So thanks very much. Enjoy your evening.